Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Tales from the Heart, a podcast from the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association. We are currently live streaming on March 22nd, 2024 at 11.05 a.m. I always give the date and time because if you're watching us live or you're watching a repeat, you can't ask us live questions if we're in repeat. Today, I am joined by, I love how Marty put his name up here today, Dr. Marty Marin. He's just Marty today. He's being casual on a Friday. So Marty, welcome to Tales from the Heart again. Great to see you. What's going on in Boston? Not much. The usual thing in March, cold and and everybody wants spring to be here, but it's not yet kind of thing. So that's kind of where we are right now. Otherwise, all good. Yeah, it's kind of cold and nasty here in Jersey. Yep. We definitely need to break through to spring now. Yep. So as we try to keep with the theme of the month, and the theme this month is Arrhythmia Management March. Arrhythmias are scary things. They don't feel nice as a patient. And they can be challenging for a clinician to recognize and act upon. So when you think about arrhythmia as an HCM, as a clinician, what are you most concerned about? So that's an irregular heartbeat or rhythm. Usually your rhythm of your heart is what we call normal sinus rhythm, nice and steady from the top to the bottom chambers for the electrical conduction. But arrhythmias are when that's not the case, when there can be disruption to that. And that can take many different kinds of forms of arrhythmias. And those can be generally classified from coming from either the top chambers of the hearts or from the bottom chambers of the hearts. And those arrhythmias sometimes can be benign or they can be concerning. And we'll talk a little bit more about how to kind of unpack that in a minute. But just because you have an arrhythmia doesn't mean that it's bad necessarily or life-threatening to you. It's a scary word, but it doesn't necessarily have to mean that. That's why I would say the best to understand what, what, you, what kind of arrhythmia you have. And then maybe before we go more, I think it's important to understand too that we're all kind of at risk sometimes for arrhythmias. And a lot of times we all experience arrhythmias even with normal hearts. The point though is that with HCM, the risk of an arrhythmia either from the top chamber or bottom chamber, benign or not so benign arrhythmias are increased in general for patients with HCM because the idea behind that is just, the principle behind that is just simple, is that if because of HCM, because of the HCM heart being structurally abnormal, that abnormal structure just increases the chances of abnormal electrical impulses occurring either from the top or bottom chamber. So that's a little bit of an introduction there. I don't know if you want to add to that at all. Sinus is normal. Tacky is fast. Brady right. is slow. Who the hell came up with these extra words? I don't know. They've been around for a long time. That's for sure. So that, that's a good definition of, good. of the three, right? Okay. That's good. That's right. And, and then maybe just sometimes people ask too, just to kind of uh, expand on that too, the, the range of just kind of a normal heartbeat, you know, normal heart rates are in regular rhythm between 60 beats per minute and 100 beats per minute. That's kind of our normal range. So just to kind of take what you just said, if you're lower than 60 beats per minute, that's a Brady or slow situation. And if it's over 100, that's tacky, fast. So tacky's got a wide range. There's a little tacky and there's a lot of tacky. So 100 and 510 may not be that concerning. 170, 180, we've got a different level of, of concern as to right. why the heart rate is going that fast. The bottom chambers, those are the ventricles. The two most important, you know, I think arrhythmias from the bottom chamber are what we call PVCs, premature ventricular contraction, PVCs. And then as well, something called VTs, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia, VT. So let's start with PVCs first. Premature ventricular contractions are beats, it's usually single beats, usually single beats from the bottom chamber that occur out of sync so that it shouldn't be occurring because they're extra and they can be isolated, meaning just a single PVC. And sometimes you get lots of PVCs over a certain period of time. Okay. And Sometimes it's, 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 it's a, monitor, a monitor that you wear that can help us determine how much PVCs you're having. But most importantly, for PVCs, usually those themselves are not life-threatening. The issue around a PVC is mostly, do you feel them? And if you do, how frustrating is that for you to feel them? And 
If so, what can we do to treat that so that you don't feel that way with the PVCs? Let's just take a second on PVCs. Normal hearts have them in and of themselves. They're not dangerous. Right. But what if you have a very high burden of PVCs? Is that a sign of progression of disease? Why do some people elevate in their number of PVCs? We're kind of talking in mostly in general terms here. But mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, I mean, if, if, if a patient has a lot of PVCs, you know, and, and again, that's something you need to talk to your, your, obviously your cardiologist about if you're having a lot of PVCs. But there's a certain cutoffs of how much we get a little bit more concerned about because if you're having a lot of them, just the fact you're having so many of them may have an effect on the on the heart in some way that we would not want to have possibly but that's unusual and that's fairly uncommon i think the most typical situation is that patients don't have a lot of them they have enough of them sometimes that they may feel them the pvcs and and are frustrated by that and that's when we get into talking about how to suppress them so that patients feel better i remember a period in time when i had a large increase in my PVC volume. We just added in verapamil at that point for me. That was what was right for me. It calmed them down. I didn't feel them anymore. And things went on for many, many years without any incident. So you can medicate to the PVCs or to the feeling of the arrhythmia. And you can talk to your doctor about different options. And it doesn't have to be a major thing. It's a small, maybe change in your medical management. So let's continue in the ventricle. Most of the time, the vast majority of the time, just everybody, that if you're having PVCs, they can actually be either significantly decreased or in a lot of cases eliminated Eliminated. just with medicines alone, you know, simply with drugs, even things as fairly benign as beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. So let's stay in the ventricle. Okay. This VT thing that gets everybody excited. Sure. What's VT and why do we get excited about it? So ventricular tachycardia, again, arrhythmia, so irregular rhythm. Again, we're talking about a rhythm from the bottom chamber, usually where the muscle is thick in ACM, left ventricle. And those rhythms, we're fo- we're so focused on those, rightfully so, because if they occur, they're very fast, right? And because they're so fast, if they continue then they don't supply blood, your heart won't supply the appropriate amount of blood to the organs, including your brain. And that's a situation that leads can lead to first, a patient potentially losing consciousness and passing out. And then if the ventricular tachycardia or VT continues in that situation, then it can become life-threatening because you're being compromised with the appropriate amount of blood flow to the rest of your organs. So that's a situation that can lead to, again, if it continues unabated, can lead to what we call a cardiac arrest. A cardiac arrest, not a heart attack, a cardiac arrest is a arrhythmia like ventricular tachycardia that is compromising or life-threatening to a patient. You brought up a good point. We hear the term heart attack a lot. Right. We hear the term sudden cardiac arrest a lot. Some people think they're the same thing. So right. let's take an opportunity and a sound bite. What's the difference between cardiac arrest and a heart attack? Yeah, so so important because these definitely get confused in the in the in the in the lay media. Card, heart attack really is referring to a term that's really referring to a situation where one of the coronary arteries, those are the arteries supplying blood to the heart muscle become blocked by a blockage. And then that blockage creates no blood flow to that part of the heart muscle. And that's it. And then that, that there's injury and damage and a heart attack. Muscle is being compromised. Heart muscle is being compromised. That's coronary artery disease, heart attack, myocardial infarction. Those are all the same kinds of terms to describe that. Now, what gets confusing is that when you're having a heart attack because of a blockage, Sometimes the decrease in the blood flow to that part of the heart that's being compromised, if that continues without getting fixed, then that can lead to an abnormal rhythm like a ventricular tachycardia and cardiac arrest. So you can have a heart attack that can lead to a cardiac arrest. What we were just talking about before, and this is the case almost always in HCM, is, is that it's a primary primary cardiac arrest that's happening, not a heart attack. The muscle itself is right. getting oxygenated, but the right. conduction system, the electrical system of the heart 
has gone out of whack right? and it's created this arrhythmia. I like to use an analogy when I'm explaining cardiac anatomy to people who are new to HCM, that your heart is a house yep. and like your house, inside the walls of your house, you have plumbing and electricity. Your plumbing are your coronary arteries, your electricity is your conduction system. It makes your heart beat. And that's where we have heart attacks and cardiac arrest and arrhythmias versus pump failure. And I know Marty's also a working doctor and there's somebody in an OR right now. So Marty may have to cut out early because somebody may need an echo while they're having a procedure. Right. So I just saw you look off camera. So yeah, I wasn't we're, sure. we're, we're good right now. Okay. If he runs away later, he has to run away. We'll continue having a, a Q&A with us alone. Ventricular tachycardia leading to ventricular fibrillation is what causes sudden cardiac arrest in HCM. We have been evolving the science, thanks a lot to you and your dad and a lot of other researchers on how we can identify those who are at risk for this particular type of arrhythmia. Right. What have we learned? There are a number of different what we call risk factors. Those are results that we identify through the testing and within patients' history that have emerged as being able to tell us pretty really well whether an individual patient with HCM may be in the future at risk for a cardiac arrest because of their HCM due to ventricular tachycardia. So we've got six or seven you know, risk factors that the presence of one or more of those risk factors in an individual patient, you know, may in fact be telling us that that patient's risk in the future is high enough for cardiac arrest that we would then consider managing that patient with preventive measures, which is what we would get into a discussion, which we would get into about the ICD. That's the ultimate treatment decision that we're making when we are identifying patients at high risk. I think the point is, is that we've gotten to a point over the last 30 years where we have a very, it's a very really mature, robust, very sensitive method with these markers that do a very good job, nothing's perfect, but a very good job at identifying those patients with HCM that in fact are at the highest risk for VT. We look at a number of different risk factors, right, mm -hmm. to help us decide. One of those risk factors, one of them, is the monitor, what we call the ambulatory monitor that patients wear. That's the heart rhythm monitor. When it tells us, and what we're doing when we're putting that on is that we're looking for evidence of what we call non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, NSVT. What is that? Those are short bursts or runs of ventricular tachycardia, the abnormal rhythm from the bottom chamber, that mm -hmm. are not usually long enough themselves to compromise a patient because they're short. But what we know through studies that have been done over the last several decades is that, that if a patient with ATM has a lot of NSVT on the monitor or other characteristics of the NSVT that are concerning maybe the length of the run or how fast they are can then lead to that finding being a risk factor. So one of the risk factors is the presence and extent of NSVT on the monitor. That is one of the risk markers. Okay. So let, let's dive in a little bit more specifically and the percentage of time or length and speed, all of these factors matter. NSVT could be considered a heart rate that pops into like the 110, 120s, but are we as worried about the 110s to 130s as we are to the 160s to 180s? Yeah, generally, number matter? Yeah, exactly. Generally not. I think what we what we what we put more weight on in terms of being concerned is when the speed of the NSVT is close to or approaching or faster than 190, 200 beats per minute, as opposed to what you said, which is slow NSVT, 120, 130, 140. So that's true. So we do put more weight on the, the speed, but again, it has to be pretty fast, 200 or faster usually. I'm going to tie in the risk factors to a case that I was talking to earlier this week, a new patient diagnosed, brothers diagnosed, one person in the family got an ICD, and this person was 
talked to by a cardiologist with some knowledge of HCM, but not an expert. And they said, quote, I'm more comfortable with my HCM patients having ICDs as a blanket policy. And I encouraged her to go back and ask what her individual risk factors were, because we don't just put devices in everybody because there's risks by putting devices in everybody. And understanding your individual risks helps you communicate with your doctor and target your therapies to mitigate your risk. Because that's really what we're trying to do here, not device up people just for the heck of it. We're trying to protect the right people at the right time with the right devices. I wish we had 100% sensitivity here. We don't, but we're getting really good at predicting who has high risk or moderate risk or low risk. Other than this NSVT, what other factors are we looking for to help make these determinations? We put weight on how thick the, how thick the heart is, right? So when the heart's in particularly extreme thickness, in general, around or greater than 30 millimeters for the thickness of the heart, that's a risk factor. If a patient's passed out, what we call syncope, at least fairly recently to the time that their patient's being evaluated, that can be a risk factor. The history of the family is important. If there are one or more members you know, in the family of that patient who have died suddenly from HCM, we put lots of weight on that as well. That's, that's important. As well as other changes in the heart, like if a patient has an aneurysm of the apex, that's uncommon, but some patients have that. And also if the heart squeeze, what we call the pump function or the EF, right, is lower than typical, you know, we'll call it ejection fraction. That's the name for that. Less than 50%. That's another risk marker. So we talked about the NSVT on the ambulatory monitor. And also the last one is when there is extensive or a lot of scar tissue in the heart muscle identified by the MRI test. So there are multiple factors. Family history does give us some good guidance. There was another case this week, and I've had a couple of these cases pop up where you don't have the family history to live off of because there's no relationship. It's an egg donor. It's a sperm donor. It's separated relationship, and you don't have that information. To dig into somebody's heart health history, how helpful to you is it to know what else has happened in a family? And when you don't have that information, how do you manage that? There's no question that it's important. I mean, I think as we just made the case, it's important, you know, because probably most important because the family history can help inform us on that patient that we're seeing their risk, potential risk in the future of an abnormal rhythm. Because, and the reason that is the case is that there are and have always been identified families, right? Yep. where the risk of arrhythmia, sudden cardiac death, rhythm issues, seems to track through multiple generations in that family. So there's something about that family's genetic makeup for ATM that seems to predispose them to that risk. So that's why knowing the family history is important because it helps to clarify for us that patient's risk in the future for life-threatening rhythms. If we don't have that information, uh, and there are lots of examples of why we may not have that, you know, then, you know, we do the best we can to get it. And if we can't get it, then we've got to uh, do the best we can by looking at all the other risk markers, you know, and, and make a decision based on that alone, basically. Um, and that comes up not infrequently because there's lots of examples of patients not being able to have access for one or more reasons to the history on either their maternal or paternal side of the family. So I think we do the best we can there, but there are limitations for sure. Arrhythmias, sudden death, ventricular arrhythmias specifically, yep. we know how to assess for sudden death risk. We know how to medicate for some of these things. There are different medications that can be used to control ventricular arrhythmias. Do we want to talk for a minute about some of the drugs that might be used? I also want to make one other point that, that's important too about the monitor. I just want to, you know, kind of clarify this because so this... I think is an important point that that the so everybody listening understands is that you know when you wear a monitor, it doesn't mean that if you have any evidence of NSVT that your risk of sudden death is then high enough that you need an ICD. Okay. Right. Right. You have to look at the whole monitor. You have to look at all the other risk factors, and that's also a scenario where getting an expert opinion about putting all of those situate all of that information together 
to give you the best recommendation about whether your risk is high enough is important. But the monitor itself, just because you have NSVT, doesn't equal ICD. So that's important because we see lots of patients who have been sort of told that and, and, and we have to you know, kind of re, readdress that issue. So that's important to understand. We have a question or a comment coming in that I'm going to kind of break down and not be as specific. An individual got an ICD and they're being recommended to have an ablation. Is there a role for ventricular arrhythmias to be ablated or mitigated through other therapies other than medical management or protection through a device? In HCM, is there the opportunity or the potential to kind of go up with catheters into the heart and using that catheter with its radio frequency energy and applying it to certain areas of the heart to stop that arrhythmia from beginning. So in other words, to treat it, to abort it, eliminate it with a catheter-based approach instead of having to put an ICD in and live with an ICD. And so that's the that's the question, I think, the background question. And here's the, you know, again, without getting without knowing the specifics of the exact situation, I'll say this that in general, for HCM there really isn't an effective catheter-based approach to get rid of these ventricular arrhythmias. And the reason that's the case is that the arrhythmias, these, these ventricular arrhythmias for ATM, can originate and often do originate in multiple different locations within the bottom chamber of the heart, not just one focus. That makes it very difficult, if not impossible usually, to be 100% reliable that if you go in with a catheter that you're going to get it. And that's why we usually don't do that procedure in that situation. There are there there's an exception or two to that. One that comes to my mind are the aneurysm patients. If you're an HCM patient with an aneurysm, because of the aneurysm, which again is an uncommon situation. So again, if you're HCM and you're listening and you don't have an aneurysm, you know you can close your ears on this. But if you have an aneurysm, that would be one exception to what I just said, where lots of VT in that situation may be amenable to correcting it or treating it with a catheter, but that's one of the only exceptions. So there are some tools that have been made available first in Europe and then in the United States. They are a little different and they give you a range of risk. So one is the ESC risk score. The other is an AHA risk score. Mm -hmm. They're a little different, but they start on a hypothesis that 4% or less is low risk, 4% over five years of an arrhythmia. Four to 6% is moderate risk and 6% is high risk. And I think that changes for each of us. How much is our risk tolerance? What is our clinical input on their tolerance for risk? And can we just discuss like why this is not black and white, yes and no, and how we balance these decisions as a clinician and as a family? To simplify it maybe, and, 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 and this is, you know, I'm taking, what I'm just saying is I'm taking out of our, a lot of discussions that we had on the last HCM national guidelines in 2020 that were led by, you know, Steve Amon and Seema Mittal. And I was, you know, fortunate to be part of that time. And one of the tasks I had was to address that question about the risk scores. To make it simple, I think here, here's, here's what I would say is that there are lots of different, there are a number of different calculators, as you just said, that you know, you can impute into the calculator on your phone or your computer, a lot of different variables that you have from your testing into that calculator. And then as you just said, the calculator kind of spits out what we call five-year risk of a life-threatening arrhythmia in a percent chance. And I think what we've learned about that is that, you know, those are, you know, helpful, perhaps most helpful, perhaps I should say, most helpful in providing some patients a little bit more information if they want it about the magnitude of what their increased risk for sudden death may be based on their profile so it's a it's a tool that puts into perspective a little bit the magnitude or how much of an increased risk that individual patient may be looking at because they have X or Y. What we don't do, and, and this is what we advised against in the, in, the, in the guidelines, was not to make a decision, a primary decision about having an ICD or not based on just the five-year 
risk calculator score because there's a lot of challenges and limitations to that to doing that kind of strategy and we don't advise that that's a 10,000 foot sort of take on how you can use that five-year risk score to be helpful but not as a primary decision maker about device it is another tool in the toolbox Thankfully, we have many of them these days. The value of your test results really do matter in the calculators. Yep. So we talk often about why high volume care matters, getting the best images through echo and MRI and getting proper measurements, proper scar quantification, proper wall measurements. These are really, really important. Left atrial dimension is one of the factors in some of these tools. So knowing all those numbers and making sure that they're as accurate as possible is gonna be really important to identifying risk and helping the patient and the physician come up with the best decision That's for right. mitigating that risk. That's right. Okay. That's right, exactly, that's right. And, and there are patients that, that, that I think it is helpful for them to understand to some degree what you know increase in risk they really may be looking at here because people, patients look, and this is one of the things I think I've learned probably the most is that there's a huge spectrum to how individual patients look at risk, even a risk of life threatening rhythms. Certain patients are willing to tolerate, you know, and accept a much greater risk that they would be willing to take on. And other patients have a much lower threshold for that. So it's a huge spectrum and providing patients who are interested some sense of what that increased risk may be looking like for them can be helpful tool. Or aid. I think the tools have been very, very helpful. I think yeah. expert input has been very, very helpful. Yep. And some very difficult moments for patients to really have to stop and think about something that they never really thought they'd have to think about. Yep. Is this method of, of potential death something that I can function with every day and be comfortable with? Or can I put it in the back of my mind and get on with my life? Or do I need this protection from this device so that I feel secure enough to live the life I want to live? That's a very hard conversation to have with yourself. I've had the conversation myself. I've thought it about other family members. They're not quick decisions. Nope. nope. And anybody who is put in a hospital because they just passed out and somebody's looking at you saying you need to get an ICD and they don't have a lot of HCM experience at that center, I would caution pause. Get some input before you agree to have a device put in your body forever. Talk to people who actually know the disease state and can help you make the right decision for you. And I have seen people make all kinds of decisions as you have, Marty, to device with a very low risk, to not device with a very high risk on a calculator. And it's their life. I go back to my favorite yeah. poem. Yeah. You have one wild and precious life. How are you going to live it? You get to make a decision. Yep. Nobody can force you. And you shouldn't feel ever strong armed into getting a device. You should feel comfortable with the concept. There is the other group of people who have survived a cardiac arrest. And it's a little bit easier to see that their risk is, quote, real because they've already experienced it. And that group of people are, in my opinion, a little bit more likely to go, yeah, I'll take one of those boxes to make sure it doesn't, the next time it happens, I get to wake up again. That's a different level of risk and that's a different risk factor. I do know some people who've survived cardiac arrest and decided, no, I don't want a device. Whatever works for you and your family works for us too. We're here to help you through the process. The most annoying arrhythmias in HCM originate in the atria. Right. We all get frustrated with it. Patient, clinician, family members. It's hard to watch your family member in AFib. It's hard to watch your patient in AFib. AFib sucks. So what is atrial fibrillation? And its cousin, atrial flutter. I mean, we kind of can, we'll put those in the same category because they're basically the same. Both of them are irregular rhythms of the top chamber. So the top chamber of the left atrium contracts usually in a one-to-one -one fashion with the bottom chamber. One-to-one, -one, each beat on the upper goes to the lower. Nice, coordinated, smooth rhythm. In a patient that goes into atrial fibrillation, that is disrupted. And there is a often significant irregularity to how the left upper chamber is beating. It's, dis it's, dis it's chaotic, it's disorganized, and therefore you don't, in that situation, get the sufficient amount or optimal amount of blood flow 
going from the upper to the lower chambers because you just don't have the same smooth one-to-one -one contraction. And that's really the issue because that problem of, of not getting the appropriate and optimal blood flow to the bottom chamber is felt even more impactfully, I guess, in HCM is the word, because HCM patients are really, even more than any other patients with heart disease, are dependent on that blood being filling the lower chamber as best as it can, because that left lower chamber obviously is thick. It's usually a smaller chamber than a normal heart. And so it's really relying on a certain amount of blood flow getting to it and then pumping that out for the body to be happy. And when it's decreased in AFib, and the decrease can be significant, 20 to 30% decrease in the amount of blood flow that's going from top to bottom, that then translates, that disconnect then translates into symptoms. The frustration that you just were alluding to for patients with HCM that go into AFib. They get very symptomatic from that reason, and those symptoms can be varied, but include being more out of breath, being just more exhausted, less energy, sometimes palpitations, of course, and, 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 and also the feeling of just not being right, you know, not feeling right or off. And that alone de can significantly decrease the quality of life of a patient, as well as doing one other issue when it happens is that it can increase and does significantly the risk for stroke. So those are the two kind of buckets, so to speak, of why AFib is important when it happens in HCM, is that if it makes the patient feel bad, that's a problem. And two, stroke risk. Interestingly, I just kind of glanced down at my phone to check our LinkedIn viewers. And there was a really interesting article that I just had pop up here. Looks like our friends over at BMS are working on a new class of anticoagulants that will reduce blood clots without causing additional bleeding risks. We know we need anticoagulants in HCM. We start in AFib. We started with warfarin, also known as rat poison, because that's what it is. And it worked really well for a lot of people, my father and sister included. And now we've developed new methods of anticoagulation, Xeralto and Eliquis. And it looks like there's going to be some other options on the table soon, which I think is really, really nice to know. Um, but why do patients need to be compliant with anticoagulation in the face of AFib and HCM? What have we seen over the years since we've gotten tighter on those guidelines? What, what are our stroke numbers looking like? I've lost family members to stroke. I've had a stroke, not from these same issues. We try to avoid this as much as possible. But why are we using anticoagulants? Why should patients listen? So the principle is that in general, this isn't just HCM, but in general, for anybody that goes into AFib, not everybody, but almost anybody, the, the AFib, because it's an irregular contraction of the left upper chamber, there can be parts of that left upper chamber then where blood can kind of pool, becomes stasis, basically, because of the AFib. And when that happens, then whenever you have stasis of blood, like when you cl cut yourself and you get blood that comes out, can coagulate, come together, and form a clot. And it's that clot that forms because of AFib in the left upper chamber that can become a source, if it moves and travels, a source for stroke, because it could then travel to the brain and lodge in there to then cause what we, what we term in a, a thromboembolic, meaning that that embolism has moved, stroke. Okay, so that's the, that's the premise. What we've learned in HCM specifically is that that risk of a stroke forming in a patient with, a, with AFib and HCM is significantly higher on average than other people with AFib and other heart diseases. So that stroke risk is really high in HCM, and there's, it's not completely clear exactly why that is, but, but, but nevertheless, it's sevenfold higher that a stroke could occur in a combination of HCM and AFib. And so for that reason, we 
generally have formulated a strategy where we have a very kind of low threshold, very low threshold, to recommend that a patient with HCM who does then develop a fib undergo treatment to prevent stroke with the blood thinner. Yeah, that's the idea here. Just so everybody's clear, in a lot of other diseases, we use scores to help us there. You know, there's certain scores that you can calculate for a patient to say, if you achieve this number or higher, then you should go on a blood thinner. Those scores do not work in HCM. So we don't have a way of stratifying because basically almost any patient with HCM that develops AFib is at high enough risk for stroke that it makes sense or is very reasonable to treat them with a blood thinner to prevent that from happening. That's sort of in a nutshell how things evolved. And by the way, with that strategy that's been in place, I think, meaning low threshold for blood thinners in HCM, we have seen a significant reduction in yep. stroke rates. We really have. It's been a, it's pr pretty amazing. It's almost unheard of in a way to see stroke in HCM today in a patient that at least has a known history of AFib for that reason. So that has made a huge difference in improving the natural history of many patients with this disease. So I'll tell you about five years ago, what we started doing here at HCMA during our intakes is asking, have you ever had a AFib? And then doing a follow-up question, are you on anticoagulation? And it turned into being quite an educational moment for a lot of people because they're like, well, I only had it once or twice and I don't really want to go on a blood thinner yet. I'm like, please speak to your specialist. The large majority of these people who were on the fence ended up going on anticoagulation. And it is incredibly rare now for us to see somebody with HCM, no AFib, have a stroke because they are protected. So it's, it's a really important sub-message with an HCM, but I think we've actually moved the mark working as a collective unit to make sure patients get the truth about the risks. Yeah, that's right. The so what problem, else can we do about AFib? One of the big associations with the possibility of developing AFib with ACM is when your left upper chamber of the heart becomes big, okay, dilated. That's called left atrial dilation. You know, I think in some patients with ACM, if they have a pretty big left atrial diameter on the echo, following them kind of closer and, and making them aware of symptoms and signs of AFib is really helpful so that we can be on top of treating that right away if it does occur. And by the way, we have very good tools now, too, talking about tools of detecting AFib at home. One of them would be the Alive Core, where you've seen those commercials where you can put your fingers on a very small device that then tells you with very high accuracy if you have AFib is a very helpful tool for patients to know whether they're in AFib or not with ATM if they're feeling palpitations or an irregular heartbeat and sending mm -hmm. information to their doctor to let them know whether or not that's in fact the case. So there are ways of being monitored, you know, as well for AFib at home with these devices that have really helped detection earlier, I think, than in, than in the past. One of the things that patients worry about is these intermittent, more SVTs to a flutter to, you know, before they're quite at a fib. And one of the items that I've kind of kept my eye on in, in the newly diagnosed patient is what the left atrial dimension is, whether there's obstruction, how the mitral valve is functioning. Is that left atria looking like it's going to start getting larger? And the larger the left atria gets, the harder it seems for it to stay in sinus rhythm. So is there anything that we can do to help predict who's on a path towards AFib and try to divert them away from that? Big wish. Well, Hard question. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll just, you know, make reference at that point, you know, this point because I think it's really important that, you know, my colleague Ethan Rowan has put a lot of work into that question and, and actually developed and published and it's available a score, another kind of score tool where you can impute information about your HCM you know, results into the calculator, and then it will tell you, you know, what your risk may be in the future of developing AFib, that, you know, your kind of per year risk or five year risk of developing AFib. And so we'd like to see that kind of tool get used more because I think it's very helpful because obviously you can start to group patients into low, medium, and high risk for AFib in the future. A lot of that prediction is is based on the left atrial size, of course, as you were just alluding to, but not all of it, but it's a big driver, but it sort of puts it all together and can help identify those patients that may be at the higher, highest risk for developing AFib who then may need or should get kind of maybe closer monitoring 
over that period of time, as I was just talking about. How we're managing AFib, ablation, medication, types of ablation. We're getting some questions. What are the different methods? What works best? What do we know about ablating atrial fibrillation? Yeah, I think there two, two, there's two treatments for atrial fibrillation if patients are symptomatic with it in particular. There's drugs, what we call antiarrhythmic drugs, or ablations. Those are the two sort of buckets for treatment. We're talking about treating the arrhythmia right now. We were a moment ago talking about preventing stroke. That's a separate issue. That, that, that's, again, low threshold for blood thinner. And by the way, on that note about stroke prevention, just to be clear, because you get asked this a lot about, is aspirin strong enough, a blood thinner? And the answer to that is no, it's not. I saw the look there. That's all you needed to see <laughs> to know. You didn't even need to say anything. My explanation is aspirin's kind of like pissing in the ocean yeah. for AFib management. It's just not enough. It doesn't really change anything. There's the classy Jersey way of explaining yeah. it. Go ahead. That's the classy way. <laughs> Otherwise, the answer is no, it just doesn't work. It's just not effective. So that's stroke prevention. So back to sort of treating the arrhythmia. And what we mean by treating it is that if you're, if you're getting AFib, coming and going, and when you're getting it, you're unhappy because of the symptoms, we got to find a way to, to, to treat that. And so there's drugs and there are ablation. Because the ablation procedure, I think, has gotten better and better and better over time here, you know, it's a way of going in with catheters to actually alter the structure of the left upper chamber in a way that can be very definitive, that there has been generally kind of, we've been moving in a direction of greater weight put on ablation as a treatment, primary treatment, earlier in the course of a patient with HCM who's starting to develop atrial fibrillation. We used to maybe in the past wait longer, you know, to sort of pull that lever in a way. And I think we learned that the earlier we're on it, I think the better we have of the opportunity of, of, of preventing more downstream issues like AFib we can't get rid of, for example, if we wait. Earlier AFib, you know, catheter-based treatment is really something that a patient with ACM needs to consider and talk to their doctor about. Does it mean it's for everybody? And there can still be a role for drug therapy, antiarrhythmic drug therapy as the first-line agent too, but it's an important discussion that you have to have. Are there any outcome differences based on whether you're using heat or cold, cryoablation or radiofrequency ablation? Does the method of killing the pathway matter as much as killing the pathway? I think there could be some differences on how people look at that question. You know, expert, you know, electrophysiologists, you know, can perhaps debate one of the, you know, the both sides of that, I think, in some capacity. I think we'll say that that's a conversation, I think, you know, when you're sort of choosing to go that route that you should have with your electrophysiologist who's going to be doing the procedure to get the best information. High volume matters. High volume matters. That's really important. You know, like a lot of things, expertise in the procedure matters here. So that needs to be evaluated if you're a patient. Any last thoughts on arrhythmia management, March? <laughs> yeah, one other thing. So I think you maybe alluded to this a second ago, but another common upper chamber rhythm is called supraventricular tachycardia. So it's kind of a, a fast upper chamber rhythm. It's not atrial fibrillation. Again, it's upper chamber, so it's not ventricular tachycardia. And sometimes when patients have those, and they're very frequent, they're not concern directly in terms of causing a bad thing to happen acutely. But like the PVC issue, they sometimes can cause patients to feel symptomatic with them. And again, they can be treated with medicines or even catheter-based approaches too. So that's another thing to look out for, SVTs. SVTs, absolutely. Okay. Believe it or not, we've whipped through an hour here. Great conversation. Yeah. I do need to, to end today with two, two announcements. First of all, thank you to all of our sponsors. You can get a full list of our sponsors on our website. I really appreciate them. Without them, we couldn't do these programs. And I need to take a moment to memorialize a really special member of the community. Jan was a longtime HCM patient who went to transplant back in 2000. Oh boy, 18 or 19, I forget right now. And unfortunately, she had consequences of her transplant and she was moved to hospice care this weekend and passed away yesterday. Jan Buchanan was a nurse. She was a caregiver. She was a crazy, funny, very unique individual who I'm very grateful to have had the chance to get to know. And I just wanted to take a moment to tell you all that she thought it was really important to share her story of HCM, both post-transplant and 
then dying. She knew she was not going to make it and a second transplant wasn't going to be available. She did record some pieces for us and we are going to put together Jan Buchanan's story and we are going to tell her story how she wanted to tell it with a little comedy, a little drama and a very real story of making the decision to move to hospice that will be coming out in the coming weeks. I was sad to see that we lost her yesterday, but I'm happy she's at peace. She was a beautiful soul. Jan, this one's for you, girl. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that soon. It, it's hard to lose clients, patients, friends, families. Unfortunately, I think I'm in a I might make, make a record book of having lost the most people to HCM that have touched my life in such meaningful ways, both clinicians and, and patients and family members. And I just want to remind us all that we're in the fight to stop families from breaking up and not being whole anymore because somebody's left too soon because HCM took them. So every podcast, every educational moment, every meeting, every engagement, is to hope that people regain life and, and health and that we can live long and healthy lives with our HCM hearts in many cases or with our transplanted hearts in some cases. Every once in a while, I'm reminded why the hell I changed my life to, to do this work. And people like Jan come into your life and they remind you sometimes how important this work is and how it does take a village. And I'm super, super grateful that we have such an amazing village and I hope to grow this village. I hope to get more of you involved. And I thank those of you who've been with us for this very long journey to get here, but there's a lot more work to be done. So I'm going to say something I don't normally say. If you think this information is helpful, if you like what we're doing to change the face of healthcare for those with HCM, think about us with your philanthropic giving. Donate. Help us find other grant opportunities and partners to do bigger projects with. We're ready. We are ready. We have the capacity. We have the team. We need to stop unnecessary deaths from HCM and, and the downstream consequences. Double down, get involved, be a little crazy like Jan. <laughs> That's all I got to say. Well said. Well said. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for joining us on Tales from the Heart, a podcast from the HCMA. And we are here for you all. And we, it, Marty, our numbers have, have gone up and up and up and up and up. We are, we are now getting two new members a day. I can remember when it was two a month, you know, one a week, two a week, two a day, new people joining us. Amazing. The Facebook community hit a milestone this week. We have 11,000 users in the private Facebook group. We have 16,000 followers on Facebook. Our Instagram is growing. Our LinkedIn is growing. Our professional reach is growing. We got a lot of work to do. Thanks for being on the team. 